Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the September 2021 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of The Commodity by Marx from 1867. This is the first chapter of the first German edition of Capital. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So, this is an English translation by Albert Drogstedt of the first chapter of the first German edition of Capital. Modern editions of Capital have a first chapter based on the second or subsequent editions. The source is Albert Drogstedt, Value, Studies by Karl Marx, New Park Publications, London, 1976. It was transcribed into HTML by Steve Palmer for Marxist's Internet Archive. Thanks, as usual, to the Marxist's Internet Archive at Marxists.org for hosting this file and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Please go check them out. Again, Marxists.org. So we will be doing Capital, Marx's Das Kapital, here on the channel. It is part of the basic Marxism-Leninism curriculum, which we have been slowly working our way through over the last year and a half. And it is towards the end. A lot of people think that to study Marxist theory, you have to like go and digest this like 1,500-page book. You absolutely do not. Uh, you should familiarize yourself with as much Marx as you can. And eventually, you know, if you work your way up to reading Capital one day, great. But there have been plenty of more concise breakdowns of Capital over the years, which take some of the main concepts and make them more digestible so that you don't have to do that. Uh, like I said, we will eventually be doing capital in full is the plan that may not happen for like another year. Uh, but it's on the agenda eventually. In the meantime, though, I came across this file and I thought that it might be useful to put out Marx's discussion of the commodity. You know, when we talk about Marxism-Leninism, Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, and Pan-Africanism, and all of the different 20th century and now 21st century thoughts on socialism that have been put out, you know, Marx is the original. You know, his work with Engels back in the day, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, and so on, uh, this is the bedrock on which all of that is based. Of course, capitalism has evolved in that time, although certain of the basic pieces of logic within capitalism really haven't changed at all. This is why Marx is still relevant. For example, we can go to Lenin's breakdown of imperialism, which is the global form as capitalism continued to expand, the global form that it took on. And then we can look at later 20th century works of how, you know, after the two world wars, which were competitions and fights among capitalists for who was going to control the whole world and what were their responses to the Soviet revolution and to the Chinese revolution and so on. You know, we can look at additional theories of how to fight capitalism on a global scale, etc. But at some point, understanding these basics, what is a commodity, what is surplus value and other key concepts within Marx is important. I realize we've been doing tons and tons of Lenin and other topics as they tend to pertain more to the politics. Uh, you know, politics and society, that is more my personal f interest and focus. Uh, I'm not really an economist per se. There are Marxist economists who really spend their time looking at charts of quantitative data on production and this and that. Um, I think that that's important, and I think it's important for Marxists to at least be familiar with enough of the basics within economics to be able to follow discussions like that. It's just for me, in terms of primary research or the way that uh, I tend to approach different topics within society, it tends not to be my go-to per se. Of course, all of Marxism is founded on economics ultimately, but when we look at implementation of what do these changes look like, building a movement and organizing. Uh, it's not necessarily, you know, economics first. I mean, we may be aiming for economic changes, but, you know, how to organize people is not exactly an economics question per se, if that's clear. 
or you know what should different social policies be in XYZ. We understand that there's an economic basis for what can happen and sometimes what needs to happen in the world, but understanding people, um, that tends to just be more of my personal focus anyway. But let's get into this, uh, The Commodity by Marx. Here we go, let's get into the audiobook. The wealth of societies in which a capitalistic mode of production prevails appears as a gigantic collection of commodities, and the singular commodity appears as the elementary form of wealth. Our investigation begins accordingly with the analysis of the commodity. The commodity is first an external object, a thing which satisfies through its qualities human needs of one kind or another. The nature of these needs is irrelevant, e.g., whether their origin is in the stomach or in the fancy. We are also not concerned here with the manner in which the entity satisfies human need, whether in an immediate way as food, that is, as object of enjoyment, or by a detour as a means of production. Each useful thing, iron, paper, etc., is to be considered from a double point of view in accordance with quality and quantity. Each such thing is a totality of many properties and is therefore able to be useful in different respects. The discovery of these different respects and hence of the manifold modes of utility of things is an historical act. Of such a kind is the invention of social measurement for the quantity of useful things. The diversity of the commodity measurements arises partly from the diverse nature of the objects to be measured and partly from convention. It is utility of a thing for human life that turns it into a use value. By way of abbreviation, let us term the useful thing itself, or commodity body, as iron, wheat, diamond, etc., use value, good article. In the consideration of use values, quantitative determination is always presupposed as a dozen watches, a yard of linen, a ton of iron, etc. The use values of commodities provide the material for a study of their own, the science of commodities. Use value realizes itself only in use or in consumption. Use values form the substantial content of wealth, whatever its social form may be. In the form of society which we are going to examine, they form the substantial bearers at the very same time of exchange value. Exchange value appears first of all as a quantitative relationship, the proportion in which use values of one kind are exchanged for use values of another kind, a relationship which constantly changes in accordance with time and place. That is the reason why exchange value appears to be something accidental and a purely relative thing, and therefore the reason why the formula of an exchange value Internal and immanent to the commodity, valor intrinsique, intrinsic value, appears to be a contradictio in adjecto, contradiction in terms. Let us examine the matter more closely. Quick comment here from me. So Marx has just introduced two major Marxist vocabulary words, use values and exchange values. So as Marx says, it is the utility of a thing for human life that turns it into a use value. So basically, a shovel is a use value because you can do something with it. As a human being, you know, typically you have two arms and two hands and uh, you can scoop some dirt with that shovel or sand or whatever. So it's useful. And so it is the utility of that thing that makes it a use value. So a use value, it's a thing, it's useful. Now, exchange values, this is also, Marx says, a quantitative relationship, a proportion in which use values of one kind are exchanged for use values of another kind, and that relationship of how many of this use value can you exchange for that use value, quote, constantly changes in accordance with time and place. So exchange value appears to be something accidental and a purely relative thing, and Marx continues, therefore, the reason why the formula of an exchange value internal and immanent to the commodity, or like this intrinsic value, appears to be a contradiction in terms. So Marx is about to go into this in more detail, but I just want to make sure people for whom 
this may be somewhat new, understands the difference between use value and exchange value. All right. A single commodity, e.g. a quarter of wheat, is exchanged with other articles in the most varied proportions. Nevertheless, its exchange value remains unchanged, regardless of whether it is expressed in X boot blacking, Y soap, Z gold, etc. It must, therefore, be distinguishable from these, its various manners of expression. Now, let us consider two commodities, e.g. wheat and iron. Whatever their exchange relationship may be, it is always representable in an equation in which a given quantum of wheat or quantity of wheat is equated with some particular quantity of iron, e.g. one quarter of wheat equals a hundred weight of iron. What does this equation say? That the same value exists in two different things, in one quarter of wheat and likewise in a hundred weight of iron. Both are equal, therefore, to a third entity, which in and for itself is neither the one nor the other. Each of these two, insofar as it is an exchange value, must therefore be reducible to this third entity, independent of the other. So commenting again, what Marx is saying here is that if one quarter of wheat can be exchanged for a hundred weight of iron, then there is the same value in those two different things, in a quarter of wheat and in a hundred weight of iron, even though they're different things and you can't use them in the same ways. They are equal to this third entity, which in and of itself is not wheat and is not iron, but it exists in an equal amount in a quarter of wheat and in a hundred weight of iron. So insofar as a quarter of wheat is an exchange value, and insofar as a hundred weight of iron is an exchange value, these are reducible to this third entity, independent of you know, the fact that wheat is a grass seed and iron is a metal. Continuing, consider a simple geometrical example. In order to determine and compare the areas of all rectilinear figures, one reduces them to triangles. One reduces the triangle itself to an expression which is entirely different from its visible figure, half the product of its base by its altitude. Likewise, the exchange values of commodities can be reduced to a common entity, of which they represent a greater or lesser amount. The fact that the substance of the exchange value is something utterly different from and independent of the physical sensual existence of the commodity or its reality as a use value is revealed immediately by its exchange relationship. For this is characterized precisely by the abstraction from the use value. As far as the exchange value is concerned, one commodity is, after all, quite as good as every other, provided it is present in the correct proportion. Hence, commodities are first of all simply to be considered as values, independent of their exchange relationship or from the form in which they appear as exchange values. Commodities as objects of use or goods are corporally or physically different things. Their reality as values forms, on the other hand, their unity. This unity does not arise out of nature, but out of society. The common social substance, which merely manifests itself differently in different use values, is labor. Commodities as values are nothing but crystallized labor. The unit of measurement of labor itself is the simple average labor, the character of which varies admittedly in different lands and cultural epochs, but is given for a particular society. More complex labor counts merely as simple labor to an exponent, or rather to a multiple, so that a smaller quantity of complex labor is equal to a larger quantity of simple labor, for example. Precisely how this reduction is to be controlled is not relevant here. That this reduction is constantly occurring is revealed by experience. A commodity may be the product of the most complex labor. Its value equates it to the product of simple labor and therefore represents on its own 
merely a definite quantum of simple labor. Comment. So um, I'm not sure what questions people would have at this point. You can leave them in the comments and maybe they'll get covered by the end of this file. Maybe they won't. But so what Marx is saying is that things in the world can be used in different ways. I mean, if there are no people around, a shovel has no use because there's no one there to use it. So it's only as useful as there is a society in which to use a shovel in which you might want to dig some dirt. And of course, there's no exchange value because there's no society. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nobody but, you know, between whom it could be exchanged. That's why he says that these values or the unity between different items through their values does not arise out of nature, but out of society. And the common social substance, which merely manifests itself differently in different use values of different forms, etc., is labor. Commodities as values are crystallized labor, and the unit of measurement of that labor is the simple average labor. And so Marx says here that this quote varies in different lands and cultural epochs. And then he talks about simple labor versus complex labor. So for example, simple labor would be you chop down a tree and, you know, with a simple hand axe and then you, you know, carve it down and you've got your axe handle and uh, maybe you take a stone and affix it to the top. Or you could, you know, set up a computer controlled factory line, which is going to do a lot of the same things. And then, you know, the labor involved there, of course, is in the building of the machine and all of that. But at the end, comes down to just, you know, pressing a button, having some energy input and other, you know, fuel or resources for the machine, etc. So the labor can be done in different ways is what he's saying. But that basically labor crystallizes into commodities as values, exchange values and use values. He'll, he's going to go over this in a lot of different ways, so... Hang on for now. Continuing. A use value or a good, an item, only has a value because labor is objectified or materialized in it, or as it, I guess you could say. But now, how are we to measure the quantity of its value? By the quantum of the value-forming substance, i.e. labor, which is contained in it. The quantity of labor itself is measured by its temporal duration and the labor time in turn possesses a measuring rod for particular segments of time like hour, day, etc. Let's read that again. The quantity of labor itself is measured by its temporal duration, how long it takes, and the labor time in turn possesses a measuring rod for particular segments of time like an hour or a day or etc. It might seem that if the value of a commodity is determined by the quantum of labor expended during its production, the more lazy and incompetent a man, the more valuable his commodity is because he needs more labor time for its completion. But only the socially necessary labor time is labor time required for the constitution of some particular use value with the available socially normal conditions of production and the social average level of competence and intensity of labor. After the introduction of the steam-driven loom in England, for example, perhaps half as much labor as before was sufficient to change a given quantum of yarn into cloth. The English hand weaver needed, in order to accomplish this change or this transformation, the same labor time as before, to be sure, but the product of his individual labor hour now represented only one half a social labor hour and sank accordingly to half its earlier value. Comment, so in other words, Marx is saying that if you just dawdle and you take three hours to make your ax, let's say, it doesn't actually make the ax worth more. It's saying how much time and effort on average in a given society at a given level of education and development does it take to produce an ax? That is, you know, one person's going to take an hour, one person's going to take 90 minutes, somebody's going to take 70 minutes, somebody's going to take 120 minutes. You take the general level of, you know, how long does it take to do that? And within that, somebody who takes longer is less efficient, and somebody who takes 
a shorter amount of time has an advantage. But it is that socially necessary labor time, the sort of average for that society that we're really interested in. Continuing. So it is only the quantum of socially necessary labor or that labor time which is socially necessary for the constitution or construction of a use value, which determines the quantity of the value. The single commodity counts here in general as average sample of its own kind. Commodities in which equally large labor quanta are contained or which can be produced within the same labor time for that reason have the same quantity of value. Let's say that again. Commodities in which equally large labor quanta are contained, or which, in other words, can be produced with the same labor time, have the same quantity of value. So the axe, which I'm randomly saying takes an hour to produce, has the same value as any other item which takes that same hour to produce as a use value. That is the quantum of socially necessary labor, we'll say one labor hour, which is socially necessary for the constitution of that use value. That's the quantity of the value in that commodity. So that ax that took one labor hour within a given society to produce is equal in its use value to anything else which that same society would take an hour to produce. Continuing. The value of a commodity is related to the value of every other commodity, as the labor time necessary for the production of the one is related to the labor time necessary for the production of the other. All commodities, as values, are only particular masses of coagulated labor time. The quantity of value of a commodity, accordingly, would remain constant if the labor time required for its production were constant. The latter, however, the labor time required for its production, changes with each change in the productive power of labor. The productive power of labor is determined by many conditions, many factors, among others by the average grade of competence of the workers, the level of development of science and its technological applicability, the social combination of the process of production, the scope and the efficacy of the means of production, and by natural relationships. For example, the same quantum of labor manifests itself after good farming weather in eight bushels of wheat, but after bad weather in only four. The very same quantum of labor provides more metals in richly laden mines than in poor ones. Diamonds are rare on the surface of the earth, and their discovery therefore costs on the average much labor time. Consequently, they represent much labor in a small volume of space. Jacob doubts that gold has ever paid its complete value. This holds even more true for diamonds. According to Eschvega, by 1823, the complete yield of the eight-year-old Brazilian diamond diggings had not yet amounted to the value of the one-and-a-half-year average product of the Brazilian sugar or coffee plantations. Given more richly laden diggings, the same quantum of labor would be represented by more diamonds and their value would sink. If one succeeds in converting coal into synthetic diamonds with little labor, then the value of diamonds would sink beneath that of paving stones. In general, the greater the productive power of labor, the smaller is the amount of labor time required for the production of an article, and the smaller the mass of labor is crystallized in it, so the smaller is its value. And on the contrary, the smaller the productive power of labor, the greater is the labor time necessary for the production of an article, and the greater its value is. The quantity of value of a commodity varies directly as the quantum and inversely, opposite relationship, as the productive power of the labor embodying itself in the commodity. So pausing there for a minute, So what Marx is saying, going back to the beginning, is that the productive power of labor affects how much you can produce with each labor time unit, whether it's, you know, labor time, like one day of labor time, a month of of labor time, etc. 
there are other factors that are going to affect what your level of productivity is. Like he said, in the case of farming, you can work your ass off and get good weather and you're going to have a ton of crops, you know, just because the plants liked it. You can also work your ass off and have really shitty weather and you're just not going to get as much product. So productivity is not always just a matter of will. You know, as he listed all those different variables, the average grade of competence of your workers in a society, the level of development of science, and how much people have figured out how to apply that science to industry, the social combination of the process of production, so how efficient is your workplace, or like, you know, how efficiently can people interact with each other in the productive process, the scope and efficiency of the means of production, in other words, how good is the equipment you're using, etc. So the productive power of labor has a relationship with labor time because if you are less productive per hour, it's going to take you more hours to get the same amount of product. Okay, continuing. Now we know the substance of value. It is labor. We know its unit of measurement. It is labor time. We have yet to analyze its form which precisely stamps the value as an exchange value. Before we do that, we must develop the determinations which have already been discovered in somewhat greater detail. A thing can be a use value without being an exchange value. This is the case wherever the human relevance of the thing is not mediated by labor. So air, virgin unfarmed land, brush in the wild state, wood growing in wild conditions, etc. These are use values which are not exchange values. Likewise, a thing can be useful and be the product of human labor without being a commodity. A man who satisfies his own need through his product creates a use value, to be sure, but not a commodity. In order to produce a commodity, he must produce not merely use value, a useful thing for himself, but use value for others, social use value. According to Marx, that's what makes a commodity, not merely a use value, but a use value produced for others, social use value. Finally, no entity can be a value without being an object of use. If it is useless, then the labor contained in it is also useless, does not count as labor, and hence does not form a value. Originally, the commodity appeared to us as a two-sided entity, use value and exchange value. As we consider the matter more closely, it will appear that the labor which is contained in the commodity is two-sided also. This aspect, which I am the first to have developed in a critical way, is the starting point upon which comprehension of political economy depends. All right, so buckle up. Let us consider two commodities, a coat and 10 yards of linen. Let the first have twice the value of the second, so that if 10 yards of linen equals W, then the coat equals 2W. A little basic algebra here. The coat is a use value, which satisfies a particular need. In order to produce the coat, a particular kind of purposeful productive activity is required. This is determined in accordance with purpose, manner of operation, object, means, and result. The labor whose usefulness is represented in the use value of its product, or in the product in such ways that its product is a use value. Let such labor here be called, for simplicity's sake, simply useful labor. From this viewpoint, it is constantly under consideration with respect to the utility, production of which is the intent of the labor. So useful labor intends to produce useful things. Just as coat and linen are qualitatively different use values, different qualities, so the deployments of labor which mediate their realities are qualitatively different, tailoring and weaving. These are qualitatively different types of labor. If those things were not qualitatively different use values, and hence 
products of qualitatively different, useful deployments of labor, then they would never be able to confront each other as commodities at all. A coat is not exchanged for a coat. One use value is not exchanged for the very same use value. There is simply no point in exchanging it. In the totality of various use values or commodity incarnations, there appears a totality of varying deployments of useful labor, just as manifold and differing in genus, species, family, subspecies, variety, a social division of labor. This is the precondition for the existence of commodity production, and it is not the case that commodity production is the precondition for the existence of the social division of labor. In the community of ancient India, labor is socially divided without the products being commodities. Or a more immediate example, in every factory, labor is systematically divided, but this division is not thereby mediated by the fact that the workers exchange their individual products. Only products of those deployments of private labor, which are self-sufficient and independent of one another, confront one another as commodities. Comment. So within the factory, uh, you know, the person who makes a button and then the person who makes the sleeve, they're not trading with each other because it's all part of the same enterprise. It's just that the labor is divided up among different human individuals, you know, who are each laboring at their part of the creation, but they're not exchanging commodities within the factory. They are just merely dividing labor on the same product. Continuing. So we have observed the following, that a particular purposefully productive activity, in other words, useful labor, lurks in the use value of every commodity. Use values cannot confront one another as commodities unless deployments of qualitatively different useful labor lurk in them. In a society whose products generally assume that form of commodity, i.e., in a society of commodity producers, this qualitative difference in the deployments of useful labor, which are carried on independently of one another as the private businesses of self-sufficient producers, develops into a multifaceted system, a social division of labor, it is a matter of indifference, in any case, to the coat, whether it is worn by the tailor or by one of his customers. In both cases, it acts as a use value. Just as little is the relationship between the coat and the labor which produced it changed in and of itself by virtue of the fact that tailoring is a profession in itself, an independent member of the social division of labor. Where a need for clothing compelled him, Man plied the activity of tailor for whole millennia before he became a tailor instead of a man. But the reality of coat, linen, and every element of material wealth, which is not given by nature in all cases, had to be mediated by a special, purposely productive activity which assimilates particular natural entities to human needs. As the former of use values, as useful labor, Labor is thereby the precondition of existence for man, independent of all social forms, and an eternal necessity of nature for the sake of mediating the material interchange between humans and the rest of nature, i.e. human life. The use values, coat, linen, etc., in brief, the commodity bodies, are connections of two elements, natural matter and labor. If one subtracts the total sum of all different instances of useful labor which lurk inside the coat, linen, etc., there always remains a material substrate left over which is present naturally without the interference of humans. Humans can only proceed in our producing like nature does itself, i.e., it only changes the forms of material. And what is more, in this labor of formation itself, we are constantly supported by natural forces. Labor is not, therefore, the only source of those use values which are produced by it, material wealth. Labor is its father, as William Petty says, and the earth is its mother. Now let us pass from the consideration of the commodity insofar as it is a use object to that of commodity value, i.e. exchange value. 
According to our assumption, the coat has double the value of linen. This, however, is only a quantitative difference, which is not yet of immediate interest to us. We recall, therefore, that if the value of a coat is twice as great as that of 10 yards of linen, then 20 yards of linen have the same amount of value as a coat. As values, a coat and linen are things of equal substance, objective expressions of similar labor. But tailoring and weaving are qualitatively different kinds of labor. Conditions of society, however, are found wherein the very same person alternately tailors and weaves, and both these modes of laboring are therefore merely modifications of the labor of one and the same individual, and they are not yet specific, definite functions of different individuals, just as the coat which our tailor makes today and the trousers which he is to make tomorrow only presuppose variations of the same individual labor. Appearance itself teaches, moreover, that in our capitalistic society, a given portion of human labor is adduced alternately in the form of tailoring or in the form of weaving on each occasion in accordance with the shifting direction of the demand for labor. This changing of form which labor endures may occur not without friction, but it must occur. If one disregards the determinacy of productive activity and therefore disregards the useful character of labor, it remains true about it that it is an expenditure of human labor power. The labor of a tailor and the labor of a weaver, although they are qualitatively different productive activities, are both productive expenditure of human brain, muscle, nerve, hand, etc., and are both, in this sense, human labor. They are merely two different forms of expending human labor power. Admittedly, human labor itself has to be more or less developed in order to be expended in this or that form. The value of the commodities, however, represents human labor in the simplest form, the expenditure of human labor power in general. Now, just as a general or a banker plays a big role in bourgeois society, but the simple human being, on the other hand, plays a very shabby role, that is the way things stand here also, in the case of human labor. It is the expenditure of simple labor power which every normal human being possesses in their bodily organism, quite apart from any special elaboration. So comment, what does Marx mean when he says that just as a general or a banker plays a big role in bourgeois society, but the simple human being, on the other hand, plays a very shabby role, meaning that that general or that banker, by virtue of the role, general, banker, those roles play big parts in bourgeois society. They have a lot of power and influence, etc. But as a human being, they're breathing the same quantity of air. They are urinating and defecating just like any other person. The simple human being playing that role of general or banker is not any more or less important, really, in the biological sense than any other. So Marx goes on to comment, take the labor power of a farm laborer, for example, for simple labor power, and take the expenditure of that labor power, consequently for simple labor or human labor, without further adornment. But take the labor of tailoring, on the other hand, for the expenditure of more highly developed labor power. While the working day of the farm laborer is represented consequently by the value expression one-half W, say, the working day of the tailor is represented by the value expression W. This difference, however, is merely quantitative. If the coat is the product of one working day of the tailor, it has the same value as the product of two working days of the farm laborer. So one is one half the value or W of the other. In this way, however, the tailor's work counts only on each occasion as multiplied farm laborer's work. So Marx is saying here that they're not really qualitatively different, mainly quantitatively different in the sense that he's considering them. They are, of course, qualitatively different in that a farmer does one thing while a tailor does something else. But for purposes of comparing them, he is merely looking at the more refined labor, the tailor, as the same essence of the farm labor, but doing more per hour, in this case, double per hour. 
And that's by virtue of what Marx is calling the refined nature of the labor, which makes it worth more per hour. You know, the simple labor power of a farmer versus what Marx is calling the more refined labor of the tailor. It's still work, but one is doing double the work of the other. Okay, continuing. The various proportions wherein differing species of labor are reduced to simple labor as their unit of measurement are established by a social process behind the back of the producers and appear to them consequently as given by tradition. For purposes of simplification, every species of labor power counts for us in the following immediately as simple labor power, whereby we are only sparing ourselves the effort involved in the reduction to it. Comment. So, in other words, how do you determine what is that baseline W, you know, or whose labor produces a W, whose labor produces a one half? Where is this refinement coming from? Is Marx just making it up? He's saying that the, quote, various proportions wherein differing species of labor or types of labor are reduced to simple labor as their unit of measurement are established by a social process behind the backs of the producers. In other words, the producers aren't involved in that. And so they appear to the producers, the people doing the work, as given by tradition. Okay, Marx continues. Therefore, just as one is abstracting, in the cases of the values of coat and linen, from the difference between their use values, just so, in the case of the labor which these values represent, is one abstracting from the difference between the useful forms, wherein labor is on the one hand tailoring labor, and the other hand, in the creation of the linen, is weaving. Just as the use values, coat and linen, are connections of purposeful productive activities with cloth and yarn, whereas the values, coat and linen, on the other hand, are mere labor precipitates of a similar species, just so does also the labor contained in these values count not on account of its productive relationship to cloth and yarn, but only as expenditure of human labor power. Tailoring and weaving are formative elements of the two use values, coat and linen, precisely by virtue of their different qualities. Different qualities of labor produce different things. But they are only the substance of coat value and linen value insofar as there is an abstracting from their specific quality and both possess the same quality, the quality of human labor that went into them. Coat and linen, however, are not only values in general, but are values of definite magnitude and in accordance with our assumption that the coat is worth twice as much as 10 yards of linen. What is the origin of this difference in their magnitudes of value or their the amount of value in each. It is the fact that linen contains only half as much labor as the coat, so that labor power has to be expended for a period twice the time taken for the production of the latter as for the production of the former. If, therefore, with respect to the use value, the labor contained in the commodity counts only qualitatively. With respect to the magnitude of exchange value, it counts only quantitatively after being already reduced to human labor without further quality to that labor. In the former case, what is at issue is the how and what of labor. And in the latter case, what matters is its how much, its temporal duration. Since the quantity of exchange value of a commodity measures only the quantum of the labor contained in it, hence commodities within a certain proportion to one another must always be equally large exchange values. If the productive power of, say, all the useful deployments of labor required for the production of a coat remains unchanged, then the magnitude of value of the coats rises along with their own quantity. If one coat represents X days of labor, then two coats represent 2X days of labor, etc. But now assume that the labor time necessary for the production of a coat rises to twice as much, or falls to half as much. In the first instance, a coat has as much value as two coats had previously, and in the latter case, two coats have only just so much value as previously one had, although in both cases, 
a coat performs the same tasks as before, and the useful labor contained in it remains of the same beneficence as before. But the labor quantum expended in its production has changed. A larger quantum of use value in and of itself forms larger material wealth, two coats being more than one. With two coats, two human beings can be clad, and with one coat, only one human being, etc. Nevertheless, a fall in the magnitude of value of material wealth may correspond contemporaneously to a rise in its mass. This contrary motion is produced by the two-sided specification of labor. Productive power is naturally always productive power of useful, concrete labor. Actually, it only expresses the level of efficacy of purposeful activity in a given extension of time. Useful labor becomes, therefore, a richer or poorer source of products in direct relationship to the rising or falling of its productive power. A change in the productive power, on the other hand, has in and of itself no effect whatsoever upon the labor represented in the value. Since the productive power belongs to the concrete, useful form of labor, it can naturally no longer influence labor as soon as there is an abstracting from its concrete useful form. The very same labor, therefore, when it is represented in the same extensions of time, is also on all occasions represented in the same magnitude of value, however much the productive power may change. But it yields differing quanta of use values within the same extension of time, more whenever the productive power rises and less whenever it sinks. More coats or whatever, in other words. In the first case, it can happen that two coats contain less labor than one did previously. The very same change in productive power, which increases the fruitfulness of labor, and hence the mass of use values yielded by it, can therefore diminish the magnitude of value, even of the increased total mass, namely whenever it shortens the labor time necessary for its production, and vice versa. It follows from the preceding, not that there are two different kinds of labor lurking in the commodity, but rather that the same labor is specified in differing and even contradictory manners, in accordance with whether it's related to the use value of the commodity as labor's product, or related to the commodity value as its merely objective expression. Just as the commodity must be above all else an object of use in order to be a value, just so does labor have to be before all else useful labor, purposeful, productive activity, in order to count as expenditure of human labor power, and hence as simple human labor. Since up to now it has only been the substance of value, and the magnitude of value, which have been specified, let us now direct our attention to the analysis of the form of value. So pausing there, what are your questions? Listen to the section again. If you're confused, I thought that that section was fairly clear in terms of what it was trying to say. So remember again, you have a commodity, which is a thing with some kind of use to somebody, which is produced for society. It's not just produced for yourself, but it's produced to go out into the world beyond yourself. So those things are going to have use values. How useful is it? And I mean, to some extent, for what? I mean, somebody will be interested in for what anyway. And the exchange value. What can you trade it for? And so Marx is here breaking down how we talk about the relationship of those values with changes in the necessary labor time, etc. All right. So continuing now with the form of value. First, let us turn back to the first form of appearance of the value of the commodity. We take two quanta of commodities which cost the same amount of labor time for their production, and hence are equal magnitudes of value. And we have 40 yards of linen are worth two coats. We observe that the value of the linen is expressed in a specific quantum of coats. The value of a commodity is called its relative value, if it is represented in the use value of another commodity in this fashion. The relative value of a commodity can change, although its value remains constant. And going the other way, its relative value can remain constant, although its value changes. The equation, 40 yards of linen equals two coats, 
presupposes, after all, that both commodities cost equally much labor. With every change in the productive power of the deployments of labor which produce them, there is a change in the labor time necessary for their production. Let us consider the influence of such changes upon relative value. So Marx here is about to delineate some examples. And if this seems very abstract, it is. I mean, Marx, as he specified in the beginning, is talking about human labor power and its productivity, which is always changing with technology and other factors. And he's also talking about within a specific society at a particular point in time. Like 40 yards of linen equals two coats is only true in particular times and places. It's not like, you know, in physics, sort of universal laws or formulas that, you know, basically seem to hold up under general conditions at different points in time and space in the universe. These are social and they are all relative just, you know, within a certain social framework. Beyond that, they may break down completely. So if it seems abstract and somewhat arbitrary because there's so many social factors here, that's true. What Marx is doing is trying to account for all that into a coherent system of understanding commodities. In other words, the production of stuff for use by other people. All right. One, let the value of the linen change while the coat value remains constant. If the labor time expended in the production of linen doubles, perhaps as a consequence of increasing sterility of the soil employed in growing the flax used in the linen, then its value doubles. In place of 40 yards of linen equals two coats, we would have 40 yards of linen equals four coats, since two coats now contain only half as much labor time as 40 yards of linen. If the labor time necessary for the production of linen decreases by half, on the other hand, perhaps as a consequence of improved looms. In that case, the linen value sinks by half. In consideration of this, we now have 40 yards of linen equals one coat. The relative value of commodity A, i.e. its value expressed in commodity B, rises and falls in direct ratio to the value of commodity A, while the value of commodity B remains equal. Two, let the value of linen remain constant while the coat value changes. If the labor time necessary for the production of the coat doubles under these conditions, perhaps as a consequence of a disappointing shearing of sheep, then we have instead of 40 yards of linen equals two coats, now 40 yards of linen equals one coat. If the value of the coat falls by half on the other hand, then 40 yards of linen equals four coats. Given a constant value for commodity A, its relative value, expressed in commodity B, falls or rises in inverse ratio to the change in value of B. If one compares the different cases, one and two, what emerges is that one and the same change of relative value can be initiated from completely opposite causes. So, in other words, you can get the same end result from entirely different processes. The equation 40 yards of linen equals two coats becomes one, the equation 40 yards of linen equals four coats, either because the value of linen doubles or the value of the coat falls by half, and two, the equation 40 yards of linen equals one coat, either because the value of linen sinks by half or the value of the coat rises to twice as much. Three, let the labor quanta necessary for the production of linen and coat vary contemporaneously in the same direction and same proportion. In this case, two yards of linen equals two coats, the same as before, however their values may have changed. In other words, in relation to something else. Their change of value becomes apparent as soon as one compares them with a third commodity whose value has remained constant. If the values of all three commodities rose or fell contemporaneously and in the same proportion, then their relative values would still remain unchanged. One would only detect their real change of value in the fact that in the same labor time, it would hold universally that a greater or smaller quantum of commodities was yielded than before. So in other words, 
relative to each other, they're still the same. So in other words, it used to take three hours to produce either 40 yards of linen or two coats. But, you know, there was a setback or a fuel shortage or whatever. And suddenly it went from taking three hours to produce either of those two things to eight hours. Well, then within a hundred hours, let's say, although the two things, you would have the same relative amount or the ratio between them as before, you would have fewer overall because it still takes more time to produce each. It's just there wouldn't be a difference between the two because both were affected by that change. The production of both were affected by that change. Okay. Four. Let labor times necessary for the production of linen and coat, respectively, and consequently their values, be assumed to change contemporaneously in the same direction, but to an unequal degree, or in opposite directions. The influence of all such possible combinations upon the relative value of a commodity may be deduced simply by application of the cases 1, 2, and 3. What we have investigated is how far change in the relative magnitude of value of a commodity, linen, reflects a change in its own magnitude of value, and we have in general investigated relative value only in accordance with the quantitative side. We turn now to its form. If relative value is the form wherein value manifests itself, then the expression for the equivalence of two commodities, e.g. x of commodity A equals y of commodity B, or 20 yards of linen equals one coat, is the simple form of relative value. So one, the first or the simple form of relative value, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, x of commodity A equals y of commodity B. This form is rather difficult to analyze because it is simple. The different specifications which are contained in it are veiled, undeveloped, abstract, and consequently only able to be distinguished and focused upon through the rather intense application of our power of abstraction. But at least this much becomes clear at a glance that the form remains the same, whether 20 yards of linen equals one coat or 20 yards of linen equals X coats. Linen makes its earthly appearance in the shape of a use value or a useful thing. Its stiff as linen corporeality or natural form is consequently not its form of value, but its direct opposite. It reveals its own reality as value immediately by relating itself to another commodity, the coat, as equal to itself. If it were not itself value, then it could not relate itself to coat as value as its own sort of thing. In other words, they both have this value. It posits itself as qualitatively equal to the coat by relating itself to it as objectification of human labor of the same type, i.e. of its own value substance. And it posits itself as equal to only one coat instead of X coats because it is not just value in general, but value of a specific magnitude. And a coat, however, contains precisely just so much labor as 20 yards of linen. By this relationship to the coat, linen swats different flies with one stroke. By equating the other commodity to itself as value, it relates itself to itself as value. By relating itself to itself as value, it distinguishes itself from itself as use value at the same time. By expressing its magnitude of value in the coat, and magnitude of value is both things, value in general and quantitatively measured value, it endows its reality as value with a form of value which differs from its immediate existence. By revealing itself in this manner as a thing which is differentiated within itself, it reveals itself for the first time really as a commodity, a useful thing which is at the same time value. Insofar as linen is use value, it is an independent thing. Its value appears, on the other hand, only in relationship to another commodity, e.g. the coat, which a coat is, is qualitatively equated to it, the linen, and consequently 
in some specific quantity counts as equivalent to it, replaces it, and is exchangeable for it. Hence, value only acquires an individual form which is different from use value, only through its manifestation as exchange value. I'm going to read that sentence again. Value only acquires an individual form which is different from use value, only through its manifestation as exchange value. The expression of the value of linen in the coat impresses a new form upon the coat itself. After all, what is the meaning of the value form of linen? Evidently that the coat is exchangeable for it. Whatever else may happen to it, in its mundane reality, it possesses in its natural form, coat, now the form of immediate exchangeability with another commodity, the form of an exchangeable use value or equivalent. That's capitalized equivalent. The specification of this big E equivalent contains not only the fact that a commodity is value at all, but the fact that it in its corporeal shape, its use value, counts as value for another commodity and consequently is immediately at hand as exchange value for the other commodity. As value, linen is composed exclusively of labor and forms a transparently crystallized precipitate of labor. In reality, this crystal is very murky, however, insofar as labor is detectable in it, and not every embodiment of commodity reveals the trace of labor. It is not some undifferentiated human labor, but rather weaving, spinning, etc., which in addition are by no means the only components of its substance, but of course are leavened with matter derived from nature. In order to retain linen as a merely corporeal expression of human labor, one has to abstract from all that which makes it to really be a thing. Any objectivity of human labor which is itself abstract, i.e. without any additional quality and content, is necessarily an abstract objectivity, a thing of thought. In that fashion, a web of flax turns into a chimera. But commodities are objects. They have to be what they are in an object-like way, or else reveal it in their own object-like relationships. In the production of linen, a particular quantum of human labor exists in having been expended. The linen's value is the merely objective reflection of the labor so expended, but it is not reflected in the body of the linen. It reveals itself, i.e., acquires essential expression, by its value relationship to the coat, by the linens equating the coat to itself as value, while at the same time distinguishing itself from the coat as objective use, what happens is that the coat becomes the form of appearance of linen value as opposed to linen body, its value form as distinguished from its natural form. In the expression of relative value, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or X linen is worth Y of coat, one must admit that the coat counts only as value, or coagulation of labor, but it is precisely through that fact that the coagulation of labor counts as coat, and coat as the form into which human labor flows in order to congeal. The use value coat only becomes the form of appearance of linen value because linen relates itself to the material of the coat to an immediate materialization of abstract human labor and thus to labor which is of the same kind as that which is objectified within the linen itself. The object, coat, counts for it as a sensually palpable objectification of human labor of the same kind, and consequently as value in natural form. Since it is, as value, of the same essence as the coat, the natural form, coat, thereby becomes the form of appearance of its own value. But the labor represented in the use value, coat, is not simply human labor, but is rather a particular useful labor, tailoring. Simple human labor, expenditure of human labor power, is capable of receiving each and every determination, it is true, but is undetermined just in and of itself. It can only realize and objectify itself as soon as human labor power is expended in a determined form as determined and specified labor because it is only determined and specified labor which can be confronted by some natural entity, an external material 
in which labor objectifies itself. It is only the concept in Hegel's sense that manages to objectify itself without external material. There's a footnote there. The concept, which is only subjective at first, marches ahead in accordance with its own proper activity to objectify itself without needing any external material or stuff for the purpose. That's from Hegel, Logic, page 367, Encyclopedia 1. And, uh, you know, a note off of that, what Marx is doing here is he's taking Hegel's dialectical reasoning and applying it to materialism and economics. And if it seems like a difficult transition, it is. I mean, this is, as Marx said, you know, his contribution to the world, this is the, the new thing. I mean, Hegel had done dialectics and so forth. And if you're familiar at all with the conflict between idealism, which says basically that ideas exist prior to the world and that ideas are the real thing and that material things follow ideas that exist in some sort of golden mind somewhere outside of reality or, I mean, I, I'm sure that there are different idealist interpretations of how actually ideas turn into matter and so forth. Materialists and Marxism is a materialist philosophy say that no material things are the bedrock of reality as it were they don't come from ideas in fact the other way around ideas come from material conditions so you know we're human beings we have a particular form as organisms we have senses and everything that we think and feel and everything basically comes out of our material experience uh, not that one is better than the other, just one is the source and, you know, one's the cause and one's the effect. If you like, not to oversimplify, but yeah. So this is the transition from, you know, this language about things objectifying themselves and so forth. Uh, if you're not already steeped in Hegel as Marx was, this may not mean a whole lot to you. I would posit that to get the useful ideas out of Marx, you don't necessarily need to be able to trace all these ideas back to, you know, these sort of like idealist philosophy that Marx inverted them from. You really don't. What we're trying to do at the end of the day is understand things like value, labor time, socially necessary labor time, and so forth. So what we're trying to do is solve problems in reality, not, you know, become gods and like write the book on... Uh, the genetic code of the universe. That's not really the aim here. Um, what we're trying to do is to explain class struggle and capitalism and how to take it to the next stage, you know, end capitalism and start building socialism without recreating some of these things. So that's why we try to understand commodities so that we can understand the system of production in which we find ourselves and have the theoretical basis of a new and different system which will not reproduce the same problems of capitalism. So understanding as much of this as you possibly can is important. And let me add also, we're about halfway through this particular file. Um, it doesn't all leap out at you at once. This is definitely a thing that, you know, in our <laughs> instant gratification society, I mean, this is the kind of thing you need to turn over in your head over and over again. I mean, certain parts of it certainly will be clearer, but how this all fits into the big picture and your life and social change, uh, that is something that, you know, it takes turning this over in your mind uh, for maybe months to really get more of a grasp on that. So if all of this is not coming together perfectly for you right now, give it time. And yeah, it's elusive. Um, you know, I found myself, uh, before I got back into Marx, uh, I'd been exposed a little bit and then went off and did other things. I found myself still thinking about this stuff, uh, just sort of independently. Um, and coming back to it, it's like, here's a guy who really sat down, wrestled with these ideas, and came up with pretty thorough answers on all of it. And uh, I remember wondering some of these same things uh, of course, I 
unlike Marx, did not sit down and write Capital. Fortunately, Marx already did, so there was no need for me to have done that anyway. And there was really no consequence for the fact that I didn't do it. Uh, but now it is time to get back to Marx, study it, and uh, you know, resume the application here in the world. After all, the point is not just to understand, but to change the world. All right, back to the text. Time cannot be related to the coat as value or incarnated human labor without being related to tailoring labor as the immediate manifestation form of human labor. The aspect of the use value, coat, however, which is of interest to the linen, is neither its woolen comfort nor its buttoned-up essence, nor any other useful quality which marks it out as a use value. The coat is of service to the linen only in order to represent the linen's value objectivity, as distinguished from its starchy use objectivity. It could have attained the same purpose if it had expressed its value in asafoetida, or cosmetics, or shoe polish. The tailoring labor, too, has value for the linen, consequently, not insofar as it is purposeful productive labor, but only insofar as it exists as determinate labor, form of realization, manner of objectification of human labor in general. If linen expressed its value in shoe polish rather than in the coat, then polish making would count for it as the immediate form of realization of abstract human labor instead of tailoring. So a use value or commodity body only becomes a form of appearance of value or an equivalent, capital E, by another commodity's relating itself to the concrete useful species of labor contained in it as the immediate form of realization of abstract human labor. We stand here at the jumping off point of all difficulties which hinder the understanding of value form. It is relatively easy to distinguish the value of the commodity from its use value or the labor which forms the use value from that same labor insofar as it is merely reckoned as the expenditure of human labor power in the commodity value. If one considers commodity or labor in the one form, then one fails to consider it in the other and vice versa. These abstract opposites fall apart on their own and hence are easy to keep separate. It is different with the value form, which exists only in the relationship of commodity to commodity. The use value, or commodity body, is here playing a new role. It is turning into the form of appearance of the commodity value, thus of its own opposite. Similarly, the concrete, useful labor contained in the use value turns into its own opposite, to the mere form of realization of abstract human labor. Instead of falling apart, the opposing determinations of the commodity are reflected against one another. However incomprehensible this seems at first sight, it reveals itself upon further consideration to be necessary. The commodity is, right from the start, a dual thing, use value and value, product of useful labor and abstract coagulative labor. In order to manifest itself as what it is, it must therefore double its form. It possesses right from nature the form of a use value. That is its natural form. It only earns a value form for itself for the first time in circulation with other commodities. But its value form has then to be itself an objective form. The only objective forms of commodities are their use forms, their natural forms. Now, since the natural form of a commodity, e.g. linen, is the exact opposite of its value form, it has to turn another form, the natural form of another commodity, into its commodity form. A thing that it cannot do immediately for itself, it can do immediately for another commodity, and therefore by a detour for itself. It cannot express its value in its own body or in its own use value, but it can relate itself to another use value or commodity body as an immediately existent value. It can relate itself not to the concrete labor contained in itself, but doubtless to that contained in another species of commodity as a mere form of realization of abstract human labor. For that, it only needs to equate the other commodity to itself as an equivalent. The use value of a commodity only exists at all for another commodity 
insofar as it serves in this fashion for the form of appearance of its value. If one considers only the quantitative relationship in the simple relative value expression x commodity a equals y commodity b, then one finds also only the laws developed above concerning the motion of relative value, which all rest upon the fact that the amount of value of commodities is determined by the labor time required for their production. But if one considers the value relation of both commodities in their qualitative aspect, then one discovers in that simple expression of value the mystery of value form, and hence in nuce of money. There's a couple of footnotes there. In nuce is in a nutshell, that is potentially. And the other footnote there is, it is scarcely surprising that economists have overlooked the form content of the relative value expression, subjected as they are to the influence of material interests. If professional logicians before Hegel even overlooked the content of form in the paradigms of judgments and conclusions. Back to the main text. Our analysis has revealed that the relative value expression of a commodity includes two different value forms. The linen expresses its value and its determinate amount of value in the coat. It manifests its value in the value relation to another commodity and hence as exchange value. On the other hand, the other commodity, the coat in which it expresses its value in a relative way, obtains precisely in that way the form of a use value as an equivalent which is immediately exchangeable with it. Both forms, the relative value form of the one commodity, equivalent form of the other, are forms of exchange value. Both are actually only vectors, determinations conditioned reciprocally by each other, of the same relative value expression, but divided like poles between the two commodity extremes, which have been set equal. Quantitative determinacy is not included in the equivalent form of a commodity. The determinate relationship, e.g. in which coat is the equivalent of linen, does not flow from its equivalent form, the form of its immediate exchangeability with linen, but from the determination of the amount of value by labor time. The linen is only able to represent its own value in coats by relating itself to a determinate coat quantum as a given quantum of crystallized human labor. And remember, he says quantum it just means amount. If the coat value changes, then this relationship also changes. But in order that relative value of linen may change, it has to be present, and it can only be formed upon given coat value. Now, whether the linen represents its own value in one, two, or x coats depends, under this presupposition, completely upon the amount of value of a yard of linen and the number of yards whose value is supposed to be manifested in the form of coats. The amount of value of a commodity can only express it in the use value of another commodity as relative value. A commodity only obtains the form of an immediately exchangeable use value, which is what is meant by equivalent. On the other hand, only as the material in which the value of another commodity is expressed. This distinction is obscured by a characteristic peculiarity of the relative value expression in its simple or first form. The equation 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or 20 yards of linen are worth a coat, includes, after all, precisely the identical equation. One coat equals 20 yards of linen, or one coat is worth 20 yards of linen. The relative value expression of the linen, in which the coat figures as equivalent, thus contains from the reverse the relative value expression of the coat, in which the linen figures as equivalent. Although both determinations of the value form, or both modes of manifestation of the commodity value as exchange value, are only relative, they do not both appear relative to the same degree. In the relative value of the linen, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, the exchange value of linen is expressly manifested as its relationship to another commodity. As far as the coat is concerned, it is admittedly an equivalent insofar as linen is related to the coat as form of appearance of its own value, and hence as something immediately exchangeable with itself, the linen. Only within this relationship is the coat an equivalent, but it conducts itself passively. It seizes no kind of initiative. It finds itself in relationship because things relate themselves to it. 
The character which is constituted for it out of its relationship with the linen thus does not appear as the result of its own relating, but as present without any additional activity of its own. In addition, the specific mode and manner in which the linen relates to the coat is exactly appropriate to the end of doing it to the coat, however modest it be, and however far from being the product of a tailor run mad with pride. The linen, after all, relates itself to the coat as the sensually existing materialization of human labor in the abstract, and hence as present value body. It is this only because, and insofar as the linen relates itself to the coat in this specific manner. Its status as an equivalent is, so to speak, only a reflection determination of linen, that is reflection determination hyphenated. Many of these things like value form are hyphenated terms. Remember that this is being translated from German. German is famous for its compound words and uh, Marx uses many of them. There's a footnote there off of reflection determination. This is a Hegelian term including identity, difference, contradiction. Back to the text. But the situation seems just the reverse. On the one hand, the coat does not take the trouble to relate itself to anything. On the other hand, the linen relates itself to the coat not in order to make it into something, but because it is something quite apart from anything the linen might do. The resultant product of the linens relating to the coat, its equivalent form, its determinacy as an immediately exchangeable use value, appears to belong to the coat in a corporeal way even outside the relating to the linen in just the same way as its property of being able to keep people warm, for example. In the first or simple form of relative value, 20 yards of linen is one coat. This false seeming is not yet established because this form expresses in an immediate way also the opposite, that the coat is an equivalent of the linen and that each of the two commodities only possesses this determination because, and insofar as, the other makes it into its own relative value expression. There's a footnote there. There is something special about such reflection determinations. This man here is, for example, only king because other men behave towards him like subjects. They believe, however, that they are subjects because he is king. Parentheses, which he would not be if they were not treating him that way, but that is affecting them. Okay. In the simple form of relative value, or the expression of the equivalence of two commodities, the development of the form of value is correspondent for both commodities, although in each case in the opposite direction. The relative value expression is, in addition, identical with reference to each of both commodities, for the linen manifests its value in only one commodity, the coat, and vice versa. But this value expression is double for both commodities, different for each of the same. Finally, each of both commodities is only an equivalent for the single other species of commodity, and thus only a single equivalent. Such an equation as 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or 20 yards of linen are worth one coat, evidently expresses the value of the commodity in only a very limited and one-sided way. If I compare the linen, for example, with other commodities instead of coats, then I also obtain other relative value expressions, other equations, like 20 yards of linen equals U coffee, 20 yards of linen equals V T, etc. The linen has just as many different relative value expressions as there exist commodities different from it, and the number of its relative value expressions constantly increases with the number of kinds of commodities which newly enter into existence. The first form, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, yielded two relative expressions for the value of two commodities. This second form yields the most variegated mosaic of relative expressions for the value of the same commodity. In addition, there seems to be nothing gained either for the expression of the amount of value, for the amount of value of linen, which obviously remains the same in every expression, is just as exhaustively expressed in 20 yards of linen equals one coat as in 20 yards of linen equals you, coffee, etc. The coffee and the etc. are only single equivalents, just as the coat was. Nevertheless, 
This second form contains within itself an essential development of form, for latent in it is, after all, not only the fact that linen happens to express its value at one time in coats and at another time in coffee, etc., but the fact that it expresses its value as much in coats as in coffee, etc., either in this commodity or that or the third, etc. The continuing determination is revealed as soon as this second or developed form of the relative value expression is manifested in its connection, we obtain then part two, the second or developed form of relative value. 20 yards of linen equals one coat or equals U coffee or equals V T or equals X iron or equals Y wheat or etc. etc. Z of commodity A equals U of commodity B, or equals V of commodity C, or equals W of commodity D, equals X of commodity E, or equals Y of commodity F, or equals etc. The first thing is that the first form constitutes the basic element of the second, for the latter consists of many simple relative value expressions as 20 yards of linen equals one coat, 20 yards of linen equals U, coffee, etc. In the first form, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, it may appear like an accidental fact that these two commodities are exchangeable in this specific quantitative relationship. In the second form, however, a background which is essentially different from and determinant of the accidental appearance immediately shines through. The value of the linen remains equally large, whether expressed in coat, coffee, iron, etc., in innumerably different commodities belonging to the most different possessors. The accidental relationship of two individual possessors of commodities falls away. It becomes clear that it is not the exchange which regulates the amount of value of the commodity, but in the opposite way, the amount of value of the commodity which regulates its relationships of exchange. In the expression, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, the coat counted as the form of appearance of the work objectified in the linen. In that way, the labor contained in the linen was equated to the labor contained in the coat and was thereby determined as comparable human labor. This determination did not, however, reveal itself expressly. At the level of immediacy, the first form equates the labor contained in the linen only to the labor of tailoring, otherwise with the second form. In the indefinite, constantly extendable series of its relative value expressions, the linen relates itself to all possible commodity bodies as mere form of appearance of the labor which is contained in itself. Consequently, it is at this point that the linen value is for the first time really manifested as value, i.e., or crystallization of human labor in general. The second form consists of a sum of the familiar equations of the first form. Each of these equations, like 20 yards of linen equals one coat, contains also the reciprocal, one coat, 20 yards of linen, in which case the coat manifests its value in the linen and precisely thereby manifests the linen as an equivalent. Now, since this holds of each of the innumerable relative value expressions of linen, we obtain three, the third, reversed or reciprocal second form of relative value, one coat, equals 20 yards of linen, U coffee equals 20 yards of linen, VT equals 20 yards of linen, X iron equals 20 yards of linen, Y wheat equals 20 yards of linen, and so on. The relative value expression returns at this point to its original form, one coat equals 20 yards of linen. Now, however, this simple equation is further developed. Originally, it only contained the fact that the value of the coat obtains through its expression in another commodity a form which is different from and independent of the exchange value coat or even the body of the coat. Now the very same form manifests the coat with respect to all other commodities whatsoever as value. Not only the coat, but also coffee, iron, wheat, in a word, all other commodities express their value in the material linen. In this way, all manifest themselves to one another as the same materialization of human labor. They are henceforward only quantitatively different. 
which is the reason why one coat, U coffee, X iron, etc., i.e., different amounts of these different things, equal 20 yards of linen, equal to the same amount of objectified human labor. It is through their common value expression in the material, linen, therefore, that all commodities differ as exchange values from their own use values and relate at the same time to one another as amounts of value, equate themselves qualitatively to one another, and compare themselves quantitatively. Only in this unified relative value expression do they all appear for the first time as values for one another, and their value consequently obtains for the first time its corresponding form of appearance as exchange value, as opposed to the developed form of relative value, form 2, which manifests the value of a commodity in the environment of all other commodities, we call this unified value expression the universal relative form of value. In form 2, 20 yards of linen equals 1 coat, or equals U coffee, or VT, or X iron, etc. The form in which the linen develops its relative value expression, it relates itself to each individual commodity, coat, coffee, etc., as a specific equivalent, and to all of them together as to the environment of its specific forms of the equivalent. No individual species of commodity counts any longer with respect to the linen as simple equivalent, as in the particular equivalent, but only as specific equivalent, whereby the one equivalent excludes the other. In form 3, which is the reciprocal second form and is therefore contained in it, the linen appears, on the other hand, as the general form of the equivalent for all other commodities. It is as if, alongside and external to lions, tigers, rabbits, and all other actual animals, which form, when grouped together, the various kinds, subspecies, species, families, etc., of the animal kingdom, there also existed, in addition, the animal, the individual incarnation of the entire animal kingdom. Such a particular, which contains within itself all really present species of the same entity, is a universal, like animal, god, etc. Just as linen consequently became an individual equivalent by the fact that one other commodity related itself to it as form of appearance of value, that is the way linen becomes, as the form of appearance of value common to all commodities, the universal equivalent, universal value body, universal materialization of abstract human labor. The specific labor materialized in it now thereby counts as universal form of realization of human labor, as universal labor. During the process in which the value of commodity A is displayed in commodity B, whereby commodity B becomes a single equivalent, it was indifferent of what specific type commodity B happened to be. The corporeality of commodity B only had to be of a different species than that of commodity A, and therefore had also to be a product of other useful labor. By the coats displaying its value in linen, it related itself to linen as the realized human labor, and precisely thereby related itself to linen weaving as the realization form of human labor. But the specific determinacy, which distinguishes linen weaving from other kinds of labor, was completely indifferent or irrelevant. It only had to be of another kind than tailoring, and in any case, had to be a specific kind of labor. It is otherwise, as soon as linen becomes a universal equivalent. This use value, in its special determinacy, through which it is linen, as opposed to all other kinds of commodities, coffee, iron, so on, now becomes the universal form of value of all other commodities, and hence a universal equivalent. The particular useful kind of labor manifested in it, therefore now counts as universal form of realization of human labor, as universal labor, precisely in so far as it is labor of particular determinacy, linen weaving as opposed not only to tailoring, but to coffee growing, mining, and all other kinds of labor. On the other hand, all other kinds of labor count in the relative value expression of linen, the universal equivalent, form two, 
henceforth only as particular forms of realization of human labor. As values, the commodities are expressions of the same unity of abstract human labor. In the form of exchange value, they appear to one another as values and relate themselves to one another as values. They thereby relate themselves at the same time to abstract human labor as their common social substance. Their social relationship consists exclusively in counting with respect to one another as expressions of this social substance of theirs, which differs only quantitatively, but which is qualitatively equal, and hence replaceable and interchangeable with one another. As a useful thing, a commodity possesses social determinacy insofar as it is use value for people other than its possessor, and hence satisfies social needs. But it is indifferent just whose needs, the commodity's useful properties related to. The commodity nevertheless can only become through these properties in all cases, only an object related to human needs, but not a commodity for other commodities. It is only the kind of thing that can turn mere objects of use into commodities, and hence set into social rapport. But this is just what value is. The form in which the commodities count to one another as values, as coagulations of human labor, is consequently their social form. Social form of the commodity and value form, or form of exchangeability, are thus one and the same thing. If the natural form of a commodity is at the same time its value form, then the commodity possesses the form of immediate exchangeability with other commodities, and consequently an immediately social form. The simple relative value form, form 1, one coat equals 20 yards of linen, differs from the universal relative value form, one coat equals 20 yards of linen, only by the fact that this equation now forms a member in the series, one coat equals 20 yards of linen, U coffee equals 20 yards of linen, VT equals 20 yards of linen, etc. In actuality, it differs thus only in the fact that linen has continued its development from a singular to a universal equivalent. Thus, if in the simple relative expression of value, it is not that commodity which expresses its amount of value, but rather that commodity in which the amount of value is expressed, which is the one that obtains the form of immediate exchangeability, or equivalent form, hence immediately social form. The same thing holds true for the universal relative value expression. But in the simple relative form of value, this distinction is merely formal and evanescent. If the code expresses its value in a relative way, that is in linen, in the equation one coat equals 20 yards of linen, and the linen acquires thereby the form of equivalent, then the very same equation includes immediately the reciprocity, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, in which it is the coat that acquires the form of equivalent and the value of the linen is expressed in a relative way. This constant and correlative development of the value form of both commodities as relative value and as equivalent no longer takes place. If the universal relative value form, one coat equals 20 yards of linen, where the linen is universal equivalent, is turned around into 20 yards of linen equals one coat, the coat does not thereby become universal equivalent for all other commodities, but only a particular equivalent of the linen. The relative value form of the coat is only universal because it is the relative value form of all other commodities at the same time. What holds true of the coat holds true of coffee, etc. It follows, therefore, that the universal relative value form of commodities excludes these very commodities from the universal form of equivalent. On the other hand, a commodity like linen is excluded from the universal relative value form as soon as it possesses the universal form of equivalent. The universal relative value form of linen, unified with the other commodities, would be 20 yards of linen equals 20 yards of linen. But this is a tautology, which does not express the amount of value of this commodity, which is situated in a universal form of equivalent, and thereby in perpetually exchangeable form. Rather, it is the developed relative value form, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or U coffee, or VT, or etc., that now becomes the specific relative value expression of the universal equivalent. Every commodity, coat, coffee, 
T, etc., possesses in the universal relative value expression of commodities a value form which is different from its natural form, namely the form linen. And it is precisely in this form that they relate themselves to one another as exchangeables and exchangeables in relationships which are quantitatively determined, since if one coat equals 20 yards of linen, you coffee equals 20 yards of linen, etc., then it is also true that one coat equals you coffee, etc. All commodities, by mirroring themselves in one and the same commodity as quantities of value, reflect themselves reciprocally as quantities of value. But the natural forms which they possess as objects of use count for them reciprocally as forms of appearance of value only over this detour, and consequently not in an immediate way. They are not for that reason immediately exchangeable just because of the way they immediately are. Thus, they do not possess the form of immediate exchangeability for one another, i.e., their socially valid form is a mediated one. It is the other way around. It is through the fact that all other commodities relate themselves to linen as form of appearance of value that the natural form of linen becomes the form of its immediate exchangeability with all commodities and consequently its universal social form in an immediate way. A commodity only acquires the universal equivalent form because and insofar as it serves all other commodities in the manifesting of their universal relative and hence not immediate value form. Commodities, however, have to endow themselves with relative value form in general because their natural forms are only their forms of use value and they have to endow themselves with unified and hence universal relative value forms in order for all of them to relate to one another as values, as homogeneous coagulations of human labor. A single commodity, therefore, only finds itself in the form of immediate exchangeability with all other commodities, and therefore in immediately social form, because and insofar as all other commodities do not find themselves therein, or because the commodity, by its very nature, does not, in general, find itself in an immediately exchangeable or social form by virtue of the fact that its immediate form is the form of its use value, not of its value. One does not, by any means, actually detect in the form of universal immediate exchangeability that it is a contradictory form of commodity, just as inseparable from the form of not immediate exchangeability as the positivity of one pole of a magnet is from the negativity of the other. Consequently, one can imagine that one could impress the mark of immediate exchangeability on all commodities at the same time, just as one can also imagine that one could make all workers into capitalists. Actually, however, universal relative value form and universal equivalent form are the contradictory, reciprocally presupposing, and reciprocally repelling poles of the very same social form of commodities. As immediate social materialization of labor, linen is as the universal equivalent, materialization of immediately social labor, while other bodies of commodities, which represent their value in linen, are materializations of not immediately social labors. Actually, all use values are only commodities because they are products of private laborers, which are independent of one another. Private laborers, which, however, depend materially upon one another as particular members, even though rendered self-sufficient, of the primordial system of division of labor. In this fashion, they hang together socially precisely through their differentiation, their particular usefulness. That is exactly the reason why they produce qualitatively differing use values. If they did not, then these use values would not become commodities for one another. On the other hand, this differing useful quality does not yet make products into commodities. If a peasant family produces coat, linen, and wheat for its own consumption, then these things confront the family as differing products of their family labor, but do not confront one another reciprocally as commodities. If the commodity were immediately social, i.e. common labor, then the products would acquire the immediately social character of a common product for its producers, but not the character of commodities for one another. Nevertheless, we do not have far to seek in this case for that in which the social form 
of the private labors consists, which are contained in the commodities and are independent of one another. It already yielded itself out of the analysis of the commodity. The commodity's social form is their relationship to one another as equal labor. Hence, since the equality of utterly different labors can only exist in an abstraction from their inequality, their relationship to one another as human labor in general. Expenditures of human labor power, which is what all human labors, whatever their content and their mode of operation, actually are. In each social form of labor, the labors of different individuals are related to one another as human labors too. But in this case, this relating itself counts as the specifically social form of the labors. Now, none of these private labors, in its natural form, possesses this specifically social form of abstract human labor, just as little as the commodity in its natural form possesses the social form of mere coagulation of labor or value. However, through the fact that the natural form of a commodity, linen in this case, becomes a universal equivalent form because all other commodities relate themselves to this natural form as the appearance form of their own value, hence linen weaving also turns into a universal form of realization of abstract human labor or into labor of immediately social form. The standard of socialness must be borrowed from the nature of those relationships which are proper to each mode of production, and not from conceptions which are foreign to it, just as we demonstrated earlier that the commodity naturally excludes the immediate form of universal exchangeability, and that the universal equivalent form consequently can only develop in a contradictory way. So the same thing holds for the private labors lurking in the commodities. Since they are not immediately social labor, in the first place, the social form is a form which differs from the natural forms of the real, useful labors, and is foreign to them, and abstract. And in the second place, all kinds of private labor obtain their social character only in a contradictory way, by all being equated to one exclusive kind of private labor, linen weaving in this case. This latter thereby becomes the immediate and universal form of appearance of abstract human labor, and thereby labor in immediately social form. It manifests itself consequently also in a product which is socially valid and universally exchangeable. The illusion, as if the equivalent form of a commodity resulted from its own corporeal nature, instead of being a mere reflex of the relationships of other commodities. This illusion strengthens itself with the continuing development of the singular equivalent to the universal, because the contradictory vectors of the value form no longer develop equally for the commodities which are related to one another because the universal equivalent form separates a commodity off as something totally excluded from all other commodities, and finally because this, the commodity's form, is actually no longer the product of the relationship of any singular commodity. From our present standpoint, the universal equivalent has not yet by any means ossified, however. What was the way in which linen was metamorphosed into the universal equivalent actually? By the fact that it displayed its value first in one single commodity, form 1, then in all other commodities in order in a relative way, form 2, and thereby all other commodities reflexively displayed their values in it in a relative way, form 3. The simple relative value expression was the seed out of which the universal equivalent form of linen developed. It changes its role within this development. It begins by displaying its amount of value in one other commodity, and ends by serving as material for the value expression of all other commodities. What holds for linen, holds for every other commodity. In its developed relative value expression, form 2, which only consists of its many simple value expressions, the linen does not yet figure as universal equivalent. Rather, every other commodity body forms in this case linen's equivalent, is thereby immediately exchangeable with it, and is therefore able to change places with it. So we obtain finally form 4. 20 yards of linen equals 1 coat, or U coffee, or VT, or X iron, or Y wheat, or etc. 1 coat equals 20 yards of linen, or U coffee, or VT, or X iron, or Y wheat, or etc. U coffee equals 20 yards of linen, 
or one coat or VT or X iron or Y wheat or etc. VT equals 20 yards of linen, etc. But each of these equations reflexively yields coat, coffee, tea, etc. as universal equivalent and consequently yields value expression in coat, coffee, tea, etc. as universal relative value form of all other commodities. It is only in its opposition to other commodities that a commodity turns into the universal equivalent form, but every commodity turns into the universal equivalent form in its opposition to all other commodities. If every commodity confronts all other commodities with its own natural form as universal equivalent form, the result is that all commodities exclude themselves from the socially valid displaying of their amounts of value. Obviously, the analysis of the commodity yields all essential determinations of the value form and the value form in itself in its contradictory vectors yields the universal relative value form, the universal equivalent form, and finally the never-ending sequence of simple relative value expressions, which sequence forms at first a transitional phase in the development of the value form, in order finally to suddenly shift into the specifically relative value form of the universal equivalent. But the analysis of the commodity yielded these forms as commodity forms in general, which thus also apply to each and every commodity, in a contradictory manner, so that if commodity A finds itself to be in one of the contradictory form determinations, then commodities B, C, etc. adopt the other in opposition to it. What was decisively important, however, was to discover the inner, necessary connection between value form, value substance, and value amount, i.e., expressed conceptually to prove that the value form arises out of the value concept. A commodity seems at first glance to be a self-evident, trivial thing. The analysis of it yields the insight that is a very vexatious thing, full of metaphysical subtlety and theological perversities. As mere use value, it is a sensual thing in which there is nothing portentous, whether I happen to consider it from the viewpoint that its attributes satisfy human needs or that it obtains these attributes only as a product of human labor. There is absolutely nothing of a riddle in the fact that man changes by his activity the forms of natural matter in a way which is useful to us. The form of wood, for example, is changed if one makes a table out of it. Nevertheless, the table remains wood, an ordinary, sensual thing. But as soon as it steps out as commodity, it metamorphoses itself into a sensually supersensual thing. It does not only stand with its feet on the ground, but it confronts all other commodities on its head and develops out of its wooden head caprices which are much more wondrous than if it all of a sudden began to dance. The mystical character of the commodity thus does not arise in its use value. It arises just as little out of the value determinations considered in themselves. For in the first place, however different the useful labors or productive activities may be, it is a physiological truth that they are functions of a specifically human organism as distinguished from other organisms, and that every such function, whatever its content and its form, is essentially expenditure of human, brain, nerve, muscle, organ of perception, and so on. In the second place, if we consider that which lies at the basis of the determination of the amount of value, the duration of time of that expenditure, or the quantity of labor, it is clear that the quantity is distinguishable from the quality of labor, in a way which is even perceptible with the naked eye. In all conditions, it was the time of labor which the production of necessities costs that had to be of concern to man, although not to the same degree at different levels of development. Finally, as soon as men work for one another in any manner, their labor acquires, in addition, a social form. Let us take Robinson Crusoe on his island. Modest as he naturally is, nevertheless he has various needs to satisfy, and must therefore perform useful labors of various sorts, make tools, build furniture, tame llamas, fish, hunt, etc. We do not refer at this time to praying and other such activities, since our Robinson derives enjoyment from them and regards such activity as recreation. Despite the variety of his productive functions, he knows that they are only various forms of activity of one and the same Robinson, and thus are only different modes of human labor, Necessity itself compels him to divide his time 
exactly between his various functions. Whether the one takes more space and the other takes less in the totality of his activity depends on the greater or lesser difficulty which must be overcome for the attainment of the intended useful effect. Experience teaches him that much, and our Robinson, who saved watch, diary, ink, and pen from the shipwreck, begins to keep a set of books about himself like a good Englishman. His inventory contains a list of the objects of use which he possesses, of the various operations which are required for their production, and finally of the labor time which particular amounts of these various products cost him on the average. All relationships between Robinson and the things which form his self-made wealth are here so simple and transparent that even Mr. Worth can understand them without particular mental exertion. Footnote there, Mr. Worth was a hack economist of Marx's day. And nevertheless, all essential determinations of value are contained therein. If we now put an organization of free men in Robinson Crusoe's place, who work with common means of production and expend their many individual labor powers consciously as one social labor power, all the determinations of Robinson's labor are repeated, but in a social rather than in an individual way. Nevertheless, an essential difference emerges. All Robinson's products were his exclusively personal product and were thereby immediate objects of use for him. The total product of the organization is a social product. One part of this product serves again as means of production. It remains social, but another part is used up by the members of the organization as necessities. This part must be divided up among them. The manner of this division will change with the particular manner of the social production organism itself and the comparable historical level of development of the producers. Only for the sake of the parallel with commodity production do we presuppose that each producer's share of necessities of life is determined by his labor time. In such a case, the labor time would play a dual role. Its socially planned distribution controls the correct proportion of the various labor functions to the various needs. On the other hand, the labor time serves at the same time as the measure of the individual share of the producer in the common labor, and thereby also in the part of the common product, which can be used up by individuals. The social relationships of men to their labor and their products of labor remained transparently simple in this case, in production as well as in distribution. Whence comes the puzzling character of the labor product as soon as it assumes the form of commodity? If men relate their products to one another as values, insofar as these objects count as merely objectified husks of homogeneous human labor, there lies at the same time in that relationship the reverse, that their various labors only count as homogeneous human labor when under objectified husk. They relate their various labors to one another as human labor by relating their products to one another as values. The personal relationship is concealed by the objectified form, so just what a value is does not stand written on its forehead. In order to relate their products to one another as commodities, men are compelled to equate their various labors to abstract human labor. They do not know it, but they do it by reducing the material thing to the abstraction, value. This is a primordial and hence unconsciously instinctive operation of their brain, which necessarily grows out of the particular manner of their material production and the relationships into which this production sets them. First, their relationship exists in a practical mode. Second, however, their relationship exists as relationship for them. The way in which it exists for them, or is reflected in their brain, arises from the very nature of the relationship. Later, they attempt to get behind the mystery of their own social product by the aid of science, for the determination of a thing as value is their product just as much as speech. Now, as far as concerns the amount of value, we note that the private labors which are applied independently of one another, but because they are members of the primordial division of labor, are dependent upon one another, on all sides are constantly reduced to their socially proportional measure by the fact that, in the accidental and perpetually shifting exchange relationships of their products, the labor time which is socially necessary for their production forcibly obtrudes itself as a regulating natural law, just as the law of gravity does, for example, when the house falls down on one's head. The determination of the amount of value by the labor time is consequently the mystery lurking under the apparent motions of the relative commodity values. 
the producer's own social movement, possesses for them the form of a motion of objects under the control of which the producers lie instead of controlling the motion. As far as concerns the value form, finally, we note that it is just exactly this form which objectively veils the social relationships of private workers, and consequently the social determinations of private labors, instead of laying them bare. If I say that coat, boots, etc., relate themselves to linen as universal materialization of abstract human labor, the insanity in such a way of putting things leaps into view. But if the producers of coat, boots, etc., relate these commodities to linen as universal equivalent, then the social relatedness of their private labors appears to them in exactly this insane form. Such forms as these constitute precisely the categories of bourgeois economy. They are the socially valid, thus objective, forms of thought for relationships of production of this particular historically determined social mode of production. The private producers only enter into social contract for the first time through their private products, objects. The social relationships of their labors are, and appear, consequently not as immediately social relationships of persons in their labors, but as objectified relationships of persons or social relationships of objects. The first and most universal manifestation of the object as a social thing, however, is the metamorphosis of the product of labor into a commodity. The mysticism of the commodity arises, therefore, from the fact that the social determinations of the private labors of the private producers appear to them as social natural determinations of products of labor, from the fact, that is, that the social relationships of production of persons appear as social relationships of objects to one another and to the persons involved. The relationships of the private workers to the totality of social labor objectify themselves over against them and exist consequently for them in the forms of objects. To a society of commodity producers whose universally social relationship of production consists in their behaving toward their products as commodities, hence as values, and their relating their private labors to one another in this objective form as equal human labor. It is Christianity that is the most appropriate form of religion with its cult of the abstract man, especially in its bourgeois development, i.e. Protestantism, deism, etc. In the ancient Asian, antique, etc. modes of production, the metamorphosis of the product into a commodity, and accordingly the existence of man as commodity producer, plays a subordinate role, which, however, becomes greater the more the communities enter upon the stage of their decline. Genuine commercial people only exist in the interstices of the ancient world, like the gods of Epicurus, or like the Jews and the poor of Polish society. Those ancient social organisms of production are extraordinarily much more simple and transparent than the bourgeois organism, but they are based either on the immaturity of the individual man who has not yet torn himself free of the umbilicus of the natural species connection with other men, or are based upon immediate master and slave relationships. They are conditioned by a low level of development of the productive powers of labor by correspondingly restricted relationships of men within their material process of the constitution of life and consequently to one another and to nature. This actual restrictedness reflects itself in an idealist mode in the ancient natural and popular religions. The religious reflection of the real world can only disappear as soon as the relationships of practical workaday life represent for men daily transparently reasonable relationships to one another and to nature. But relationships can only represent themselves as what they are. The form of the social process of life, i.e. of the material process of production, will only cast off its mystic veil of fog once it stands as a product of freely socialized men under their conscious, planned control. For that to happen, however, a material basis of society is demanded, or a row of material conditions of existence, which are themselves, again, the primordial product of a long and painful history of development. Political economy has by now, to be sure, analyzed value and amount of value, even if incompletely. It has never even so much as posed the question, why does labor manifest itself in value, and the measure of labor by its temporal duration manifest itself 
in amount of value, forms upon whose foreheads it is written that they belong to a social formation wherein the process of production masters men, but not yet does man master the process of production. Such forms count for their bourgeois consciousness as just such a self-evident natural necessity as productive labor itself. Pre-bourgeois forms of the social productive organism are accordingly treated by political economy roughly like pre-Christian religions are treated by the fathers of the church. Just how drastically a section of the economists is deceived by the fetishism which sticks to the world of commodities, or by the objective illusion of the social determinations of labor, is proved, among other things, by the tediously pointless contention about the role of nature in the formation of exchange value. Since exchange value is a determinate social style of expressing the labor which has been applied to a thing, it can no more contain matter than the rate of exchange, for example. The commodity form was still relatively easy to see through as the most universal and most undeveloped form of bourgeois production, which for that reason appears even in earlier periods of production, although not in the same prevailing and hence characteristic way. But as for more concrete forms like capital, for example, the fetishism of classical economics here becomes palpable. In order not to anticipate, however, let another example concerning the commodity form itself suffice. It has been observed that in the relationship of commodity to commodity, e.g. of shoe to shoeshine boy, the use value of the shoeshine boy, i.e. the utility of his real, material properties, is completely irrelevant to the shoe. The shoeshine boy is of interest to the commodity, shoe, only as form of appearance of its own value. So if commodities could speak, they would say, our use value may be of interest to a man, but it does not inhere in us insofar as we are things. It is our exchange value that inheres in us as things. Our own circulation as commodity things proves that. It is only as exchange values that we relate ourselves to one another. Now just listen to how the economists speak forth from the very soul of the commodity. Value, exchange value, is a property of things, riches, use value of man. Value in this sense necessarily implies exchanges, riches do not. Or riches, i.e. use value, are the attribute of man. Value is the attribute of commodities. A man or a community is rich, a pearl or a diamond is valuable. A pearl or a diamond is valuable as a pearl or diamond. Quoting S. Bailey. Up to now, no chemist has discovered exchange value in pearl or diamond. Our authors, who lay claim to special critical depth, find, nevertheless, that use value inheres in objects independently of their material properties, but their exchange value, on the other hand, inheres in them as objects. The remarkable circumstance that the use value of things realizes itself for men without exchange, thus, in the immediate relationship between thing and person. But their value, on the other hand, realizes itself only in exchange, that is, in a social process, is what strengthens them in their belief. Who is not reminded here of that excellent dogberry who teaches the night watchman sea coal, quote, to be a well-favored man is the gift of fortune, but to write and read comes by nature, quoting Much Ado About Nothing. The commodity is immediate unity of use value and exchange value, thus of two opposed entities. Thus, it is an immediate contradiction. This contradiction must enter upon a development just as soon as it is no longer considered as hitherto in an analytic manner, at one time from the viewpoint of use value and at another from the viewpoint of exchange value but is really related to other commodities as a totality. The real relating of commodities to one another, however, is their process of exchange. And that is the end of the audiobook. So, I know I commented a lot more in the first half than in the second half. I know that this material can be somewhat intimidating, uh, and I wanted my coaching to at least get you started. And hopefully the second half... Maybe you had digested enough of the terms with some of my help in the first half that you could sort of muscle through the second half. Again, this is not material, which generally is incredibly clear in the beginning, particularly as Marx takes this kind of, at times, philosophical approach or seemingly philosophical approach 
to the material. He's very particular about phrasing some of these relationships in strange or at least unusual ways that we're not used to thinking about commodities and objects and exchange. But part of the idea here is that we should learn to think about them in these new ways. And of course, these concepts are developed in much more depth throughout Marx's later work, particularly Capital. So again, this is just the first chapter of the German edition of Capital. And uh, these concepts become reinforced through repetition and elaboration in later chapters. So if you're still a little bit baffled, like I said, you know, repeating this work, but also going further into Marx, if you understood even half of that, uh, you know, you can go on to the rest of the stuff and there will be gaps on first pass or second pass or maybe even third pass. But as you continue to read and struggle through it and say, well, I get this part, but I don't get that part. Well, make a note of what you do get and what you didn't get, what's going over your head or what is just, you know, what the hell is Marx saying in this particular point? And if you can say, well, I got these three paragraphs, you know, pat yourself on the back because you got those three paragraphs. Once you can delineate what you do know and differentiate that from, you know, what you don't know, you're already several steps ahead of where you started from. So that's key in this process of learning this material. It really is a different approach to production and economics, etc. But it's infinitely more valuable than, you know, basic micro and macro economics that they're going to teach you in college or maybe in an advanced high school course. It's kind of hard to find Marx. Uh, I mean, Marxism for academic study in a university setting, at least in the bourgeois countries, uh, with the exception of maybe a sociology department. You're almost definitely not going to study Marxist economics, even in passing, even in a survey, in probably any econ department. However, they do teach Marx in sociology, at least to some extent. You know, individual programs are going to do more or less. Uh, you know, I did uh, study sociology in college, and we did all this. So I personally came out of college understanding economics from a Marxist perspective um, but you know that's again not typical it's not typical for most people to study sociology at all let alone to sort of focus on Marx within it that's not to say that uh, Marx is not recognized in bourgeois sociology I mean Marx Weber and Durkheim are kind of considered the progenitors and you know forefathers of sociology although now you know the focus of many sociology programs is definitely not something like that. Anyway, I digress. Um, what I also wanted to mention before moving on is that in these discussions of economics from Marx's perspective and his particular, you know, spin and interpretation that he put on things, not spin in a sense, but the overall framework that he came up with for understanding these relationships, uh, it's a little bit deeper than spin. Um, he developed a lot of these theories by studying Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, etc., and elaborating on that and criticizing that and taking his previous studies of philosophy and, you know, coming up with a theory because capitalism, nobody sat around during feudalism and theorized capitalism. It just kind of happened. There were scientific developments and it emerged organically and you know, people like Adam Smith, after the fact, turned around and described what was already happening. Marx was different in that he criticized capitalism and then projected a future system, which would be antagonistic to capitalism, in the way that he had observed and understood, you know, there to be this dialectical, antagonistic relationship between past modes of production, each of which had superseded the last in a historical progression, he was theorizing the future. Uh, nobody really did that with capitalism originally. It just sort of happened. But socialism is the first example of a mode of production which was theorized first, and then, you know, people through revolution tried to implement it. So, you know, you get a lot of sort of like 
very basic conservatives and, uh, you know, people who studied basic economics, quote unquote, you know, standard orthodox microeconomics and things like that. Uh, they often will have the assertion that, you know, Marxists don't understand anything about capitalism. Nothing could be further from the truth if you have studied Marx, because Marx studied capitalism intensely. I mean, and understood it probably better than any of these basic conservatives stumbling around today preaching the religion of microeconomics, which, as we know, doesn't fucking work. It's constantly going into crisis and... Although it has unleashed huge productive forces and we've developed incredible technologies, they're not being used in a way that actually serves the mass of people in society. It's where Marxism, Marxism-Leninism, and related ideologies come into play. I'm going to leave it there for right now. What do you think? Leave some comments. Let's continue the discussion. But in the meantime, thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. All those donations are very encouraging to me. I really appreciate it. And they're also materially helpful. So thank you for that. If you'd like to support the channel without making a financial contribution, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting are all good ways to do it. Helps to boost the channel, puts this material in front of more eyeballs, and expands the conversation. Whatever it is you do in your community and online to spread the conversation about socialism, thank you for doing it. Keep it up, and we'll catch you in the next video.